May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A wise friend of mine was going through cancer treatments. He understood himself as someone who worships God regularly, someone who carves out time for meditation and spiritual practice, who is radically in tune with God to the best of his ability. So he couldn't help but feel that when he got cancer, that he and God could fix it, that he could heal himself with the help of God. With God, anything is possible, was his refrain. He would fight this cancer, and he expected God to join him there in his fighting. But that didn't work. In fighting, he had realized that he did not accept his cancer diagnosis fully. How could this be the will of God for me to be sick like this, he protested. He would not surrender control. He would not surrender to his experience. And he remained in fighting mode, fighting this cancer. But one day, distressed, he reached out to God in a different way than he had tried before. He decided he would surrender. He would try to accept his sickness as the will of God. And he chanted the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done, thy will be done, God's will be done. And then he heard from God. He received a gift from God so strong it almost felt like a voice saying, My beloved son, my will is the same as your will for yourself, for you to be strong and healthy and well. When we put our hope in earthly things, we are sure to become disappointed. When we accept painful realities as the will of God, we are deceiving ourselves and selling God short. When we put our hope in communities, in government, in other individuals, our hope will be dashed on rocks because those things are not God. But God wants us to worship God first and not make idols of each other, of our human systems, and of our expectations. It is hard to tell how to worship God, what to accept as the will of God, and what to seek to change with the help of God. Today, on the first Sunday of Advent, as we enter the season of preparing for God to come into the world as the Christ child, we lift up our hearts to God, prepared to approach God differently than we have before, to prepared to find hope only in God. Hope is the word of the day. Hope is a precious commodity. Hope slips away easily. Today we get to contemplate together where we have planted our hope, and how we water it. In the dark winter months, it will be important to remember where we have planted our seeds of hope, as snow covers the earth, as the days continue to grow darker. How do we nourish our hope while we wait? And waiting is uncomfortable. Our three scripture readings today discuss waiting. And in hoping, there is surely waiting. Because hope recognizes that the reality we live in is different than how we want to be living. In hope, we strive for something beyond. Isaiah, before he delivers his prophecy, he exalts God first. He says, come, let us go up to the mountain of God. God will teach us his ways, and once we have worshipped God, we as people 
We'll turn our instruments of war into instruments of farming. This is his hope. But first, he goes to God. He doesn't have a planning meeting among people about how to turn the instruments of war into instruments of farming. He goes up to the mountain of God and worships God first. And then says in an act of co-creation, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Those are sacred words. Perhaps we can plant our hope there. These words are inscribed in a sculpture outside of the United Nations. We worship God first, and what comes from that is a co-creation, somewhat unexpected. And in our second scripture in Romans, the letter speaks again of waiting, of the darkness in the night, of putting an armor of light on to live honorably, and even further, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to worship God in our very flesh, to put God into our expectations, not for them to be made of our own will. And finally, from our gospel lesson from Matthew, Matthew holds for us the mystery, the anticipation, the anxiety of waiting. He says, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And in some ways, we do know when our Lord is coming. It is on Christmas, that is December 25th. We celebrate the coming of Christ, the cyclical return of the baby Jesus. And in other ways, we have no idea when, how, Jesus will break into our lives and into our reality on this earthly realm. Our neighboring pastor of South Church Thea Rosellis wonders as she writes. She writes, sometimes I wonder how many times did Christ come to us in forms that we weren't ready to recognize before walking among us as human. We await the return of Christ. What if we're looking for the wrong signs? We're waiting for a human, but what if Christ is coming in community? as community? What if Christ returns as water? Or the song the wind makes when it blows through bamboo leaves, rustling and creaking as they give and bend? What if Christ's presence is revealed each day in small wonders? Will we be too distracted to recognize God in our midst, in our next breath? What are our expectations for what Jesus looking, entering into the world looks like? And what are our hopes? And what is the difference? Mary grows, Mary the mother of Jesus, grows with expectation, just when she is least expecting it. Although pregnancy takes nine months in the liturgical season, we have about four weeks until Christmas. And I think of Mary now, beginning to grow aware of what is within her, of the danger and the hope, the risk and the surprise, the potential of what she is carrying. Our God, our Savior, our Lord, our Christ child rests within Mary's womb. The potential of life awaits us, so we wait with Mary. We anticipate as we expect the realm of God to break into our ordinary lives and bringing us the birth of Jesus, the birth of love and hope and peace. When we are expecting something with hope, so much seems enchanted, especially when we expect a child 
the most miraculous gift of all. We don't wait passively when we hope. We co-create with God, and indeed pregnancy is this. When couples expect, they don't really know what they are expecting. Do you remember that book? What to expect when you're expecting, that's written because no one knows what to actually expect. The process of adoption is like this too. You don't know what to expect, and children are such a surprise as they burst into the world. And we know too that pregnancy doesn't always end the way we expect and the way we hope. And sometimes the results can be devastating. Expecting Jesus is not a simple or easy or passive task. Mary, as she is expecting, is filled with defiant hope. Hope against hope, because her life is at risk with the new reality and expectation of Jesus. Joseph, too, who has the wisdom to listen to his dream that says, take this woman as your wife and take the child you have named, you will name Jesus. Take him as your son. Joseph risks his life by doing this too. And they are both glorifying God in new ways as they expect Jesus with hope, knowing not what to expect as his parents. Where have you planted your hope? What have you put your hope in? How do you water your hope? These three texts that we just read are texts of waiting, of anticipating, of preparation to aid us in the arrival of the Christ child. And they all point us back to God in our waiting. How do you glorify God in your waiting? Do you go up to the mountaintop like Isaiah? Do you proclaim peace among nations? Do you wait anxiously, knowing God is with you? Do you keep alert? Do you cloak yourself with Christ as an armor of light? How do you glorify God in your waiting? And in our waiting, it is worth reminding ourselves that our hope is first in the Lord. Because we can risk making idols of things if we put hope entirely in our institutions or other human beings or ourselves or the government or churches even. If we put hope in humans and human-made institutions, they will always let us down. But if we put hope first in God and sit with the discomfort of waiting and watering that hope, God will meet us there. Expecting something that is both divine and human, expecting to co-create with God, means that we're allowed to expect something of ourselves and expect something of our community and the world, but that we must be patient as we wait, as we expect because our hope is first with God. Like my friend with cancer, who is now cancer-free, by the way, he waited, he surrendered to his experience, and he planted his hope with God, and reached out to God in new ways. And God joined him in his hope at an unexpected time. God did not meet him in his clear and succinct expectations. God met him in his foggy and distressed hope. Hear this poem called Hope by Victoria Safford as we close. She writes, Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism which are somewhat narrower, nor the stalwart gates, boring gates of common sense. 
nor the strident gates of self-righteousness which creak on shrill and angry hinges. People cannot hear us there, they cannot pass through. Nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything is gonna be all right, but a different, sometimes lonely place, the place of truth-telling about your own soul first of all and its condition, the place of resistance and defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is and as it could be, as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but joy in the struggle. And we stand there beckoning, calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. Amen.